ALF went through a very um, drastic change and a shift in his life in 2016, um, 15, when the, the brother suffered a heart attack. And through it all, he's been able to put out this awesome book, We Made It a Hot Line. I want to introduce to some and present to others Alfred Obiesi. Tell me about how you've been able to continuously cultivate your creative gene. And and some of you know some of how that looks, because it's not just writing because you make beats. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. So if you're trying to turn your passion into something that's lucrative. You need to have some sort of foundational structure of what a business is. So you, you can have a general idea of, hey, yeah, this is what I think I need to do to turn my passion into something that actually generates money. But if you don't have first-hand experience as to how that actually functions like a day-to-day, -day, if you don't have any day-to-day -day experience, you're basically going to be guessing and assuming. So when I decided that it's something that I want to do for a living, funny thing is it actually worked in reverse because the first thing I was doing, I was working in accounts receivable, create a $25,000 invoice for a bunch of cats who were just smoking weed on the guitar. We're having a conversation, and you know, five minutes later, I'm like, all right, cool. You send the tape off to the messenger, I'll go create the invoice for 25 grand. And I'm like, <coughs> like I said, I'm a bookkeeper, it's like 97. This invoice is my entire yearly salary at that point in time. I'm like, I'm on the wrong side of this equation. What's the first thing you ever wrote? The first thing I remember people acknowledging, and I thought it was terrible, my junior year in high school, I got wrote some corny poem about like, the subway or whatever. And the teacher was like, oh my god, this is good. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Was it like high cool and stuff? Like, you know, you told I don't even remember. Like, remember like, it, right? And the funny thing is, I don't remember what it was. All I remember is, in my mind, it wasn't good enough to be getting any kind of accolades. But when, when I actually started writing, I kind of had like all the flashbacks of where did this come from? And I constantly and consistently remember my English teacher in college saying, that's, that's good. That was a pretty good paper. Right. My school teacher saying, like, you can write. People, people responding after I would respond to a blog, like, you can write. I'm like, what exactly does that mean? I'm not a writing major. I've never like studied writing. So you tell me I can write. To me, I'm just speaking on paper. I've heard it enough times from a bunch of different people who don't know each other for it to be somewhat true. Let's see what I can do. So I started the uh, crazy African that blog spot blog. That's where I just started like putting out of red, putting yeah. out random ideas and just. When did you realize you wanted to write a book? That's the question. Like, at what point did you say, yo, you know what? I'm gonna write a book. I think that's like around 2010, 2011. It was one of those things where it's like, okay, you have, you think you have these skills. What can you do with it if you were going to do something with it? I've always been big on being able to do something without needing a whole bunch of people to do it because when you're waiting for other people, they have to be the same. You have to find them to be the same skill set and they have to be on the same time as you. So let me do something where I can control the timetable. And that was the book. Again, listening to what you've heard, well, what are you going to write about? Write about what you love. I'm a hip hop producer. I've grown up in hip hop. It's rooted in the way we literally communicate and talk. So. Again, one of the, I guess, unspoken rules of hip hop is if you're going to do something the original, so I'm not going to write a typical listicle of the fifth, your top five MCs and why. So I was trying to find like an original component as to, well, what is the genre done? Well, that's not necessarily the chronicle, but it's relevant, and that's the influence of it. How much of the book was finished when you had your heart attack? Uh, I would say about 50%. And point of clarification, it wasn't a heart attack. What was it? Sudden cardiac death. Right. So there was no attack. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a complete, like, uh, my heart just. So what happened? So, from what, again, from what I was told, because I woke up a week later in the hospital, I, I was told that I was playing basketball and. Like I played with the Morgan Stanley team at, the point, at that time, so we played every Tuesday or whatever, so I'm playing ball. And I said, you know what, I'm tired, I'm going to go sit on the bleachers. Which, if anybody knows me, should have known it was a red flag. I'm not taking myself out of a game, right? just ridiculous <laughs> like that. So, apparently I took myself out and I'm on the bleachers and somebody heard like a, a kicking kind of noise. So, I had some sort of seizure. They're like, they just turned around and heard like me kicking. 
and that's they start with CBR and pay somebody who's on the gym and who needs CBR, build the defibrillator in the gym. And I keep on saying I, I was one of the cardiac lotto, like it couldn't have happened in a better, better place, place. Right. like you know, yeah. two blocks away from the hospital. Right. In addition to all that, you're a Presbyterian is down in the lot. Wow. Wow. So like those are the circumstances, but but as it relates to what caused it, that's still undefined in terms of maybe I don't get tested or the we have no clue, it didn't happen, whatever. So mm -hmm. So you wake up a week later. So I wake up a week later. And what do you think when you wake up? Like what do you like? So I wake up and my brother's in the hospital. Right. My brother lives in Oregon. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. What you doing? What you doing? <laughs> and the funny thing is I was like, I must have had a heart attack because there's no reason you just, what are you doing in New York? Right. And no one's telling me what's going on at that point in time. Like, I didn't I didn't find out what happened until I ran into one of my other friends who went to Tech and EMT in walking in the corridor on Saturday. Because they're just being, oh, you passed out, you're in a test, we don't know what happened, everyone's being real ginger with it. He was the one who was like, nah, bro, you died. Right. And I was like, oh, shit, I just like, I have no clue. Like, what the fuck is going on? Like, so when, like I said, I opened my eyes, I saw my brother, I saw my mom, I'm seeing family members, and I'm just, what is going on, man? What do you mean it's been a week? What do you mean I've been in a coma? What do you mean I've been induced? There's a whole lot of what do you mean. I'm trying to process things that one doesn't process. Like, I still can't get over the fact until this day that a week passed and I wasn't conscious for it. Right. Don't even remember it. Don't lose it. Nothing. 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 Like, all the memories I have were of nightmares that were drug abuse. What was the biggest struggle from the time you woke up until you considered yourself fully rehabilitated? So I think one of the biggest components was the mortality factor. Saturday I find out that I'm getting the device for the rest of my life. So they're like, oh yeah, we're going to give you an ICD. It's not a pacemaker, but it's, it's, it's kind of like a defibrillator internal in case it I'm like, alright, cool, so how long do I need to keep that on? They're like, nah. That's it. Pick one. Like, right. you get the square one or you get the round one. Like, this is, this is it. So I'm in the hospital, like, and again, I'm Nigerian, so my mother had every doctor, either a cousin or a distant right. something, and everyone from London, Nigeria, is calling which one you should have with device. They all have an input that's valid. So I'm like, and I'm just sitting there going, wait a minute, I'm going to have a device in the rest of my, nah, I said that ain't Nah. What, what, what else, what are the other options? Because I don't do that. So they're like, okay, you can have the vest, which you have to put on every day and wear every day and make sure, and it's not as effective, but by the time they were done expanding the vest, I was like, alright, I'll take the circle one. I'll take the circle one. So yeah, like, but again, like, I think that was the first time throughout that whole thing I cried, just the fact that you're mortal, bro. Like, like, and even though they told me you don't need this device to survive, the fact that we need to put this there just kind of gave me a sense of yeah, everything has an end. That line is there. So you get better. Mm -hmm. When do you start writing again? And why? Because, I mean, you had so much other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Why on earth would you consider the manuscript? Like, at what point do you say, okay, well, I'm going to get back to that. And why? Why get back to it? It was already in motion. And again, I was already accountable to myself. But I had already set up an inner structure. I was accountable to other people. My boss, Adam Morgan Stanley, at, the point, at that point in time, became my business partner. He's an, he's an art major, but he also had a right, he was also a writer, and he was also, he also designed, so he saw that we were doing it, we, we got really cool, I was like, okay. And then one of my, Harold, we saw he's uh, my business partner too, but he, he's always out there, the, wor the, the, the world travel, basically, HP's always out and about, and my boy Shane, who's like kind of, you've asked him anything about computers and what's going on, so in my mind, I'm like, okay, if these are the people who are around me, it would make perfect sense if I were trying to do something to utilize what I have, and they're all actually there with it. So we started having one track line meetings, like, I remember we're gonna launch on, this on January 1st, and everyone needs to have X amount of like, articles ready. And it was to the point that it was so, it's so crazy, like, we were so consistent with it that 
that Sunday in the hospital, we had our Sunday meeting. <laughs> like, I'm in the, and I'm trying to walk away far, far enough, and I remember this, I'm trying to walk far away enough from the other person I'm sharing a room with, <clears throat> but the phone is on the court, it's like, it's connected <laughs> to the wall. So I'm on the phone, like, in the window, having my, my, my meeting, like, there was never a point in time where it was like, oh, no, I need to stop doing this. Like, it was always kind of like, okay, you were planning on doing this anyway, now, now that you've assessed what you need to do and what you don't need to do, and you've come to the conclusion that this is what you were, you were, you were on the right path as you deem, go harder kind of thing. So I'm like, the book has to get finished this year. That, that whole event accelerated to the point where I'm like, there's no way I'm not finishing the book this year. Did the reality of mortality add a sense of urgency to you? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so you made it a hotline, right? Mm -hmm. It comes out 2016. Mm -hmm. It's a book that reads like some of my favorite Facebook statuses. So one thing that you do well is you are able to take hip hop issues and things and you naturally broaden it to bring in the human interest factor or the society interest factor. And you was doing that on Facebook. Yeah. Like, you know, way before this book. So the book reads kind of like those, those quotes. Um, those statuses. You picked 21 lines. Mm -hmm. How hard was it to pick these lines? From a societal and social impact, you get to narrow it down. I mean, you still have to have a huge, I guess, the breadth of knowledge. And again, I happen to just grow up in it. So I have 30 some ideas of having random songs to pick from. Right. And the hip hop is essentially the modern day griot, like sort of things where the social messages are embedded in the lyrics anyway. Some of them are deliberate and intentional, some of them are subversive, but the point is they're absolutely there. So now you just have to go and find the ones that, res that resonated the most with your community and kind of be pompous enough to believe that other people felt the same way you did. Right. So one of my favorites, you took the line, same damn low sweater, times is rough and tough like leather. That's from Ray Kwan mm -hmm. from Cream, yeah. right? You say here in paragraph three, in order to deflect your subpar socioeconomic status, you had to own at least one exorbitant item from the esteemed polo collection, right? Now, I mean, people can look at you right now and see what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that that struck with me because of the truth behind that statement in the beginning of paragraph three, like because. We grew up in a, a depressed state of socioeconomics. How do you show someone who you are when you can't afford four pair of jeans? When you got three pair of jeans and you got two shirts, how do you, and you go into a world where social connections are everything. And even though you may live in Albany projects, you go to a school like Tech or a school like Midwood where there are, there are kids whose parents, who have two parents, correction officer parents, civil service parents, and they're able to afford X, Y, and Z. The pressures of being a child in a depressed situation that only knows how to express themselves in a social connectivity by how they look or by how they act. Absolutely. And so what, what you wind up getting is people who boost in the 80s and 90s, boosting is very um, prevalent because people wanted, people looked at clothing as a show of confidence and a show of who they were. It was essentially, your, your presentation was the quickest way to social acceptance. Right. And when you come up with a point, I'm so glad that kids don't, I don't know what kind of pressures kids have these days, but they didn't have the fashion pressures that we had. No. Back. You had like five labels to choose from back right. today. Yes. <laughs> and we have that so like right. now, Whatever it be fine. You can make your own stuff. You can make your own shirt now. And, this is the age right. of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If it wasn't, and again, if it wasn't Tommy Paul, Ralph, at yes. a certain point in time, guess you at a certain point in time, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> you may not have everything. You may not have the the balls to go boosting, and you may not have the financials to go pay for it. But you will find a way to at least get one piece of social acceptance. So at least on Friday. But it's reflective, it's, it's kind of like it's down to do representation that it's reflective of affluence, but it's a constant reminder that you're not there. Let's talk about the nuts and bolts of the book. So you finished the book, mm -hmm. you sourced the artwork from 
your man, right? That's your whole team, right? Mm -hmm. So you guys get it together. What's your strategy in terms of production, marketing, promotion? So I kind of, again, I wanted to do everything as autonomous as possible. So I, I, I always intended on putting it out there and I also kind of intended on using the lesson that I learned from music and applying it to the writing. Like I wasn't trying to get a publishing deal or none of them, you know, I need to find a publisher. I started looking around and just said, yo, for what I want, I love hip hop and try to do it just I want a, I want a quality book, I want it to be color, I want hardcover. They're talking like sixty, seventy dollars manufacturing cost for my ninety-six page book. So now I'm at like page five, six <coughs> of Google. Right. I'm, I'm at the back of the back of the how to get it right. done. And I find I found a company that's essentially based in China. I'm like, you know what? Gave them a call, seen I see them. They sent samples of work they had previously done. You know what? I'm gonna see if, if this is gonna work. So taking the artwork, taking the writing. Had a bunch of friends proofread it, proofread it myself so many times that I don't think I've looked at the book in its entirety since that whole process kind of got, it's been a lot. So after I got all that, like I said, I found I got the work from the manufacturer said that they were going to do what they needed to do. I ordered 500 copies. And I picked those up in April and I was more than happy, but it was based. The funny thing is, it was based on the way they were treating me. That's the funny thing about why. Not because they were trying, the cause was absolutely a, a, a factor, but they were responsive. And I'm like, I'm co reaching out to all these companies and they're kind of treating me like I'm not about to spend thousands of dollars with you. Okay, but they're like, nope. And no matter what time of day it is, she responded to my email, here are the samples, what do you like, we can't do this, but we can do that. But I'm like, from customer service alone, I'm going to assess your personality. And and no, I mean that's the product they are you know, more than happy with what they did, so you wanna give them a shout out? Shout out to everyone that came. <laughs> shout out to Mabu. <laughs> shout out to everyone. Like I said, I mean everyone that came, everyone that bought the book, all the fans, definitely <coughs> sweet six oh seven you for having me. Like I absolutely appreciate the opportunity to black business, supporting black businesses. It's a, it's a very, very dope thing, so I thank you for your story. I thank you for your courage. I thank you for writing an awesome hip hop book that should go into the annals of hip hop history in terms of one of the great books written about hip hop. Appreciate it. Um, I look forward to volume two. That's it, bro. Be good. I thank you. Give a round of applause.